How you been? I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you, Tommy. My best wish is for the this new year. Ah, same to you. Same to you. <laughs> I'm just trying we to all... stay warm. You know, I can't deal with all this cold. Oh, it's cold <laughs> in uh, in Edinburgh. It is cold. Yes, it's always yeah, it's cold terrible. in Scotland. Terrible. These people uh, don't even know what sunshine looks like. Oh my, it's not for us. It's not for us at all. It's not for us. <laughs> <laughs> That's the nicest way of saying it. <laughs> okay, uh, I will just uh, introduce, uh, as uh, we have decided before the COVID, it's to have some conversation with an uh, interesting person, interesting in terms of uh, thinking, and uh, to make some trouble in the mainstream uh, thinking. <laughs> And uh, you are one of them. <laughs> of course I am. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> you are one of them. And uh, it's my pleasure as a co-chair of the France Finance Foundation to have you for this conversation. And uh, you, if you remember, we have one during COVID. And uh, yes, we would is. like to have a monthly, almost monthly, one conversation with different thinkers. And... Um, um we i was when we met for the first time in the uh, in the Ecole des Hautes Etudes uh, Raspai Boulevard if you remember some years ago yes. uh you talk about masculinity and um it 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 it's um it came it came uh, with some uh, thinking i am but uh I don't know how to uh, to concretize this thinking about uh, because in the in the environment in the general environment now it's just uh, on uh, feminism mm -hmm. and uh, if you are not feminist you are against humanity certainly right yes and uh, I think it's also really interesting to see how we the masculinity, black ma masculinity could be interrogated because uh, most um, the way the black man, black male are, uh, are uh, treated in the, in the white environment and in the, in the, in the, in the, how do I could say that, in the, in the way the people are thinking about humanity uh now it's very interesting how the hierarchy is also humanity first of all it's a woman of course uh, children mm -hmm. and men are all are, are always at the at the bottom of this thinking mm -hmm. and they are they are they are uh, considered as uh, enemies and it is in fact uh, what uh, the system the capitalist system uh, system is uh, thinking about man Black men, particularly, they are mm -hmm. at the bottom and they are treated as enemies, and that is why uh, we would like, as the French Finance Foundation, to go further in this thinking and to uh, to have your uh, your your uh, idea, your uh, your perspective, and uh, how we can uh, how we can uh, uh, change change uh, the format of uh, this uh, men's uh, thinker thinking. And uh, that is why I will uh, give you the floor to listen to your conversation with uh, Norman and you. Well, both thanks. of you, you are me. from uh, from now. Both of you are from uh, Edinburgh University. Yes. And uh, I hope soon we will have uh, with uh, Nels with uh, Asdin we will have the opportunity to visit you in Edinburgh, even if it's cold and humid. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will. We will certainly. We will certainly make sure we invite you out uh, yeah. and host you, because uh, I think I think we should definitely have a much closer relationship with the yeah. France Fanon Foundation, and mm -hmm. and this should be a second home to you and to the thought and the and the kinds of work that you're doing. So we mm -hmm. we will definitely make that happen. And uh, if I just may add some some one point, it's uh, this kind this uh, sort of conversation uh, could be also uh, the basis for the next rencontre of the France Fanon Foundation. Well, that's fantastic. Mm. Okay. I, yeah, we should Please. definitely do that. You Thank have you. the floor, Norman, and you. Sorry, Norman, I did not speak directly to you, but... Uh, no, no, no a... problem. No problem. Yeah. 
we have plenty of occasions to speak together, no problem at all. <laughs> so <clears throat> what I wanted to to discuss today with with uh, with you, Tommy, is um, the concept of abolition. I think one of the things I would like to do with this conversation and the next, if we if we if people think we should uh, carry on with those kind of conversation with those kind of, of format um, is to discuss several uh, core concept of the history of uh, the black radical tradition, black thought, mm -hmm. black politics, decolonial thought, anti-colonial politics and, and theory. And I think one concept that is pretty pervasive these days is the concept of um, abolition, which mm -hmm. is arguably one of the oldest and most important concept of um, black thought in the Americas, like one of the first ideals of a autonomous black radical thought uh, related to the question of abolishing uh, slavery as a system and uh, the transatlantic slave trade and the question of what to do after that, what kind of destiny, what kind of future for Black people. And of course, I think this notion of abolition has a history of transformations, a changing, shifting history, and it is reused and relabeled these days. I think it shifted, it changes with the question of abolishing uh, the police, uh, mm -hmm. the prison industrial complex, and all the uh, different terms we may use to label this question of massive imprisonment of Black people, and of course, mm -hmm. massively, especially Black males, Black men, and, and even, even boys, even teenagers. So this question, I think, this new question renewed the notion of abolition, and I think we should have maybe a little conversation in order to both um, define this concept and also maybe to um, point out uh, some pitfalls of certain discourses, mm -hmm. some of certain uses of this term, of this notion, because I think uh, if we see how sometimes this term is used today, we tend to lose track of its mm -hmm. revolutionary roots. And sometimes even, maybe we're gonna say a little, maybe mo a little more about that, but sometimes it seems almost to have become a very reactionary and very mm -hmm. anti-Black notion, which I think it was not for the most part of its history. So- Absolutely. Uh, yeah, are you, what do you think of this notion? Do you think it's an important notion for uh, the history of Black thought and Black politics? Uh, are you interested in this concept? What do you think mm -hmm. about, about its destiny? Well, well, it's it's interesting to me because the ways that concepts have been deployed throughout Black liberation have always been up for co-optation by larger discourses, be it the white left and liberals or even amongst more conservative or, or mainstream Black people. The, the nation that contemporary black political thought has to black militancy and anti-colonial revolutions across the world um, is a real cause for concern, not only in the sense that most black movements say like Black Lives Matter have sought to get gifts and recognition from their oppressor, but it also changes the way that we think. So because we don't have a material situation where black contemporary politics are on the ground fighting uh, sometimes violence with violence or adopting boycotts and protests, trying to harm the economic and capitalistic mechanisms that white supremacy utilizes to harm black folk generally, we have an uh, embrace of rhetoric and discourse. So abolition becomes another rhetorical tool that people utilize to convey a sentiment of the mass incarceration system, our police, our white supremacy that has no legs. It's a It's a... It's a redemonstration of the begging slave asking for humanity because we appropriate terms from the black radical condition 
and our black radical tradition without any understanding of the real conditions and the real efforts and the price that has to be paid for trying to make those things a reality. You can say all day you want to abolish the police, but none of the academics that are leading this charge are engaged with fighting the police. That's been placed on the backs of poor, working class, uneducated black people. You can say all day that you want to abolish the prison system, but you don't have any kind of community governance, self-determination or agreements within neighborhoods themselves on how you should deal with rises of crime, et cetera. You still depend on your oppressor to save you from your very people. And this has been utilized by some people uh, in the feminist movement and black feminist movement as a justification to not abolishing the police because of the presumed danger of black men. We're not in the same circumstances. We don't have the same racial consciousness that we had in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s that gave rise to these terms. And when you look at the history of enslavement and Black resistance against slavery, you have Black people fighting against white oppressors. And we have to be very clear. It is the it is the fortitude and endurance of black African descended people against white people that created these concepts. These are not concepts that owe themselves to the genius of one man or woman. These are concepts that have been collectively defined throughout the history of black people fighting against white imperialism, colonialism, and violence. Given that, that means the background has been a racial group against a racial group. The issue of abolishing certain things, like even if we look to Angela Davis's idea of abolition democracy, she's building from Du Bois and Douglas because they want to abolish institutions of black degradation. degradation. You want to abolish slavery. You want to abolish the convict lease system. You want to abolish the kinds of institutions that are given about in Western societies that are used to dehumanize and incarcerate and remove black people from society. Society. Now, given that assertion, we have to then look at, well, what does abolition really mean? It means that there are going to be elements in a white supremacist society that do not allow black people to express their full dignity, have a quality of life, or not be stained by the curse of blackness as if they're inferior. There are institutions that preserve the notion of black inferiority and then create the lived realities of black people who are impoverished, not having access to education, not having good health care, being exterminated by the police or white vigilantes. That is what creates black oppression. So to abolish those mechanisms allows us to think about a world where black people could be freer. The reality of the situation, however, is that we're not silly, simply dealing with slave owners anymore. We're not simply dealing with racist white people that support segregation. We are now dealing with a modernized state in the United States, Europe, etc., that has coordinated its efforts not only with police and governmental power, but also with knowledge, controlling the consciousness by which people seek to actually revolt and actually seek to protest their own, their own oppression. And I have to say that given this moment in the 21st century, Black people do not have the kind of intellectual content and substance necessary to make the theories that we invent a reality. We're not you we're not trying to fight against the police as if we're protecting communities. We're fighting against the police to get Nobel Peace Prizes by announcing ourselves nonviolent. We're not building coalitions <laughs> with poor black people because the black people in the academy that are creating theories about abolition are scared of the poor black people they say they speak on behalf of. They won't step a foot in black neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. The places where I'm from in the deep south where black people pretty much finish high school, if that work on docks, do industry work in chemical plants, those are not the black people that are being centered in conversations about black liberation. Those are black people who are designated as, work as workers or what Bowman would call the new poor, right? The wretched of the earth like Fanon. But those people don't hold the concern of the theorists that are talking about abolishing institutions because the theorists in the white academy still depend on those poor black people to be exploited so they can live their comfortable bourgeois aspiring lives. You see, the, the dynamics by which black people understand themselves no longer exist primarily on race. And as such, the people that want to abolish institutions are taking paternalistic attitudes to oppress poor, to <laughs> oppress black people. So poor black people are uneducated who don't agree with the politics of the black elite. These people are also put on the chopping block. So abolition has lost much of its historical teeth. Because you remember that black revolutionary movements from slavery all the way to civil rights have been based on the sentiments and the power of working class poor black people, black people from the South largely, that sought to fight against white supremacy. If you want to integrate into that system, sure you want to be free, sure you want less incarceration, sure you want less discrimination. 
but you want that for access to white institutions. You're not trying to reformulate the very basis of society. And more importantly, you're not trying to reformulate the consciousness that links all black people together. Now black people define themselves out of blackness. If you're a woman, your womanness takes you out of the degraded status of blackness. If you're queer, your queerness pulls you from the degraded status of blackness. If you're educated, it separates you from the ignorant Negroes that no longer can be part of society. This is the system of recognition and revolt that we have in the United States and elsewhere. It is not a system that immerses itself on the black people who are suffering, where we understand that abolishing capitalism, mass incarceration, et cetera, are goods in themselves because it's costing us black life. It's producing black death and black corpses. We don't have that sentiment anymore. So I think that largely the idea of abolition is, is teeth despite its contemporary radical uses that are praised by the left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've, I've witnessed in, in uh, black theory a certain shift that I find quite revealing. Um, this idea that more and more, I see this definition of abolition as the building of life-affirming institutions. It's something that we see quite often. And mm -hmm. I am quite interested with this idea that um, abolition is now redefined as something that is not abolishing anything, that mm -hmm. is supposed to be just add something to the world that supposedly um, has a revolutionary aspect, but we tend to um, avoid the question of what should actually be destroyed about the existing world. Mm -hmm. Because Absolutely. you see, <clears throat> creating life-affirming institution is clearly not something that Black failed at doing, quite the opposite. Exactly. You know, right? The history of the Black church, the history of Black music, the history of you know the building of Black communities is something that is integral to the history of Black people in the, in the Americas mm -hmm. from, from North to South, right? It's something that clearly Black people always did for survival and always did for like physical survival and, and intellectual and, and spiritual survival. It's not something that they failed to achieve. So I don't know right, why right. we are acting like it is something that should be embraced as if it were something that is absolutely new and revolutionary. What, unfortunately, Black people fail at doing, so to speak, is to gain sovereignty, gain mm -hmm. self-determination and destroy... Exactly. The, the actual existing institution of, of white supremacy. And I think basically, as you said, this, this was originally what abolition was about. And I think mm -hmm. it tends to be something that is less offensive, less combative, something that is less about, as you said, opposing those existing institutions, but instead trying to reform them. So it tends to become reformist and mm -hmm. tends to, you know, if going from political black autonomy and affirmation to a certain notion of, of yes, perverted integration or uh, mm -hmm. kind of uh, cultural, cultural differentiation instead of uh, political uh, 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 self-determination. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the idea here is that black, when you're looking specifically at the condition of, of Black intellectuals in the United States, and I want to use them as an example, integrationism is the guiding ethos behind their interpretation of Black political theory. So you can make an author like a Franz Fanon or Martin Delaney into an integrationist because you don't emphasize the self-determination and belief in the future of the people. You emphasize the humanism right, that presupposes that Black people being recognized as human does enough work in terms of the, of the moral psychology of white people to allow them to participate in a white-built society. In other words, you want to enjoy the spoils of a white-built society and introduce the idea of a Black human into it purely on the notion of recognition without actually asking yourself, does the historical turmoil and tragedy that emerged from the, the Holocaust of Black people, right? From the dehumanization of Black people, enslavement, imperialism, colonialism, et cetera, create a morally, a morally, uh, a society that you want to be morally integrated into. 
See, and this was the question that even King was asking. Well, what are we integrating into? A burning house, a failed civilization? So if if we if we take seriously the mo the notion that we want to abolish something, why then do we want to be part of a society that created the thing that needed to be destroyed? So if we take seriously that the idea of the European has been such that it created a notion of black inferiority, that has created the justification for multiple genocides, not only against African peoples, but people it's defined outside of the white kind of whiteness. Why then do we want to take in the values and the structures of that society as if that society can remedy itself? You see, if we, if we take seriously the idea that black people are embracing uh, abolition, then that means that we have to abolish the very notion of the white human that's being offered to us mm -hmm. as an extension for our own humanity. If a white person wants to recognize you and say you're a human like I'm a human, that should be automatically rejected because the notion of white humanity has only created violence and, and, and tragedy in its wake. There are mm -hmm. values of resistance that we see in black people, be in Africa and America, et cetera, that created black history and notions of black liberation and black freedom precisely because it did not want to participate in the kind of colonial heritage and legacies that you get from Europe. But that's not what we do today because those ideas of the European university and the knowledge and the idea of capitalism, et cetera, is beneficial. It's beneficial for us to, to reinterpret the black radical tradition as if it's just an extension of the overall progress of humanity to fight for liberty. But when you ask the question on black liberation, the question of black liberation is, would the white oppressor even exist? And that's a very real material question. Would the white oppressor, would Europe, America, et cetera, even exist if black people were free? Well, no, because black freedom, right, were, is the antithesis to the idea of the subjugation that allows black people to be the working class, the exploited and the killed. So we have a dishonesty. And that doesn't mean that people can't be for reformism. If you're a reformist, you're a reformist. But don't try to call abolition, which is a radical idea of eliminating the institutions, ideas and worldview, the very paradigms that Europe has used to justify its colonization and murder of darker people around the world as the basis of what you want to be reformed. We have to entertain the idea that white humanity is, in fact, inhumanity to every other group of people. And that doesn't mean that we have to call for the genocide of Europeans or the murder of Europeans, <laughs> but it means we have to be honest that there is a fundamental incompatibility with the idea of black liberation and black institutions that affirm the dignity and self-respect of black peoples, and then the history and contemporary machinations of white supremacist societies that either eliminate race saying it doesn't matter to the lived experience and realities of black folk around the world or they co-opt black people and attack them because they're talking about the ways that racism fundamentally corrupts the notions of democracy that they say are about human equality and love for everyone mm -hmm. right that is the problem is that we are allow european we are allowing our oppressors to incentivize the misinterpretation of our theories and intellectual legacies purely on the basis of a select class of black elites that are rewarded for doing so and at some point history reality and truth have to matter to black people and we can disagree once we've established that but we can't keep assimilating terms like abolition and then utilizing them to 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 further preserve institutions that white people built based on what they're willing to give us. You wanted to add something, Mireille? No, I, I was uh, just thinking. Don't you think? Don't you think the ter the concept aboli ab abolish abolition uh, was uh, was perver perverti 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 perverted mm -hmm. perverti. Perverti. yes yes. Uh, uh, um, at, uh, during the the movement of abolition of enslavement, because at the moment when they abolish enslavement, they give compensation. They gave compensation to the criminal yes, and not yes. to the victim. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that since since this period, abolition is a is a concept is a miss. Is a misconcept. It is not mm -hmm. used as abolition to to break something uh, unfair, uh, but to to integrate, as you mentioned, uh, Norman, to 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 obtain the integration of the victim. Yeah, I think uh, it's a very good point because I I think yes, 
it, it, it built this 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 moment where when uh, it was the case in the US, it was it was the case also in the French colonies, in right? French, mm -hmm. yes. Of course, uh, that abolition could be also beneficial for the enslavers or for the white supremacists, yep. and that there is oh, a common a ground here. That mm -hmm. yes, you're going to be free, but the white people, the white mm -hmm. oppressors, the racists, going to be compensated, mm -hmm. and then everyone's going to be pleased with this, with <laughs> with this question of abolition. And maybe yes, maybe we are still living under this illusion. It's it 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 is it is abolition. It is abolition uh, <clears throat> for the. It is an abolition for the system, but yes. for mm -hmm. the enslaved uh, for the, the enslaved people, it was not abolition. Because mm -hmm. they were still forced to work for the former uh, uh, criminal, for the former criminal. Yes, yes. Yeah. And this and this is the problem, right? When when black people mm -hmm. like Douglas or Delaney are talking about abolition, they're talking about the fundamental elimination of institutions and structures that allow mm -hmm. white people to have the power to oppress black people. When white people thought about abolition, it's let's ab abolish the practice of enslavement and replace it with the convict lease system. Or let's okay. abolish, or they, like they did in the, you know, Britain did. Let's abolish slavery, and then we'll pay the white people who unjustly enslaved African people the amount of money they lost for the the illegal enslavement of black folk. So, so what you see, and this is what I mean when I say the dishonesty and the misrepresentation of the concept. If you believe that slavery is a moral evil and you want to eliminate slavery, why then are you enriching the people that participated in an immoral evil? The answer to that question is we still believe in the power and the prestige and superiority of Europe. So we don't want white people to lose money or the nation to lose money on the backs of what they're doing. However, when you look from the perspective of black folk, transforming enslavement to imprisonment or mass incarceration and impoverishment within a specific Western nation is putting them at the same kind of level as the enslaved, right? I mean, people like Frank Wilderson believe this viscerally, right? That blackness is always a slave, no matter what changes happen. I wouldn't mm -hmm. go that far, but it is it is an interesting claim to make us think about the ways that humanism, the values of democracy, et cetera, still lead to black subjugation despite the time period. And what we've done is we've failed to admit that the failures of the white abolition movement that was more interested in saving white souls cannot actually represent any kind of connection to black abolition th theories, which are trying to abolish the very basis by which white people have the power to oppress everyone else. And this mm -hmm. is something that's really overlooked in the historiography of how we talk about black militancy and black power. When you read Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton, they are talking about racism as if it is an institutional and social practice where white people have the power to impose racial inferiority on black people. So what Carmichael was saying is that if white people didn't have power, then their thinking doesn't matter. We're dealing with a situation where power, the ability to make what's in a white person's mind, the reality for racialized people is the major issue. And the rhetoric of abolition doesn't change that. You can want to be part of the economic or political system that participates in harming racialized people, but there's no serious theories that are trying to to actually get rid of those because that teeters too closely to anarchism. It teeters too closely to militancy. And these are very demonized and police words in modern day academic discourse and even in uh, organizing spaces in the United States. Everything has to be integrationist, it has to be feminist, and it has to be nonviolent. So that means that it completely changes the trajectory of practically every anti-colonial and black militant movement that we knew grew up from the 19th century and the 20th century. And that, that gives us a moment for, for serious reflection. How is it that 200 years of black revolution involve black men and black women trying to overthrow their oppressors, sometimes nonviolently, but sometimes violently? And now you have a 21st century incantation or a reincarnation of the very same idea that wants to be friends with your oppressors, that defines yourself out of the oppressed group, and that participates in every kind of liberal political agenda that's put on the platform of the Democratic Party as if that's what revolution is. You see, is this is this dishonesty, right, mm -hmm. about the intellectual trajectory, is a lack of seriousness about how Black people have historically thought about things that lead us to this problem. Because you're producing Black scholars in Black studies that talk about race but have no actual material understanding of racism. 
So as long as you virtual signal that I'm a black person, somehow that's enough for your experience to count. But it's not talking about the actual ways that poor working class black people are being systematically targeted and removed from a society. If you take out young black men uh, from a society, from a home and neighborhood, and you leave black women struggling, that neighborhood's going to be impoverished. Those black women are going to be oppressed. So what you do then is you define black people as a function of cultural inferiority. You create a logic within the society that says they can't seem to succeed. They can't seem to raise themselves up. They're not entrepreneurial. They're not intelligent. And you use that as the justification to justify systematically eliminating them. And you have certain classes of black people that actually think the world would be better off if you abolish certain groups of black people. So now you have people who talk about abolishing oppressive systems, aligning with the system to say that there is a problem people, young black urban men who are poor, uneducated, and isolated from society that need to be getting rid of. You see, so the language is very dangerous because what we've done is we've taken a symbol of black radicalism and we've allowed it to be translated into the wills of our oppressors. If you, black people hate the same black people that white people hate, we need to start thinking about the black people utilizing the term. There is no place in the world for, or no place in black liberation for black liberatory aims to align with the sentiment and interests of the oppressor. That is, that is an asymmetrical world. But we now exist in a world where people are telling us that abolition or abolishing institutions is necessary, but we believe that the problem people, the young, dangerous black men that these institutions like mass incarceration aim to target are in fact really a problem. We yeah. bind to the same ideas and the same ideology. We don't have any sense of group cohesion, and we don't have any understanding how power and, and violence actually affects the kinds of research, knowledge, and ideas we produce. That's a very, very dangerous position to be in. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly what Sylvia Winter argued like almost 30 years ago in uh, No Humans Involved. No right? Humans Involved, yeah. That our intellectual class tends to separate from this class of Black men from the working class that are not, you know, as interesting as the uh, proletariat, the white proletariat used to be. And, uh, oh, two, two minutes left. So maybe we, we make a, a second call to... Yeah, that's fine. Yeah? Okay. Okay, fine. We're back at it. <laughs> you okay, Tommy? Yeah, I'm perfectly fine. Um, okay, I, yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. So... Um, you touched, you quickly touched uh, this conversation we tend to see about this idea of abolishing black men, which is, mm -hmm. I think, quite bizarre to me. I, th I think I have two possible interpretations of this, this phrase that became uh, used on social media, especially Twitter, especially in response to the emerging field of black male studies, among other things. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have two equally appealing interpretations of this idea of abolishing <laughs> black men. What do you call right, it? right. In the, maybe the most optimistic interpretation would be that uh, black men as a gender should be reconstructed or should be transformed or transcended something and along those lines but mm -hmm. then the question is why especially black men and not black or, women every or black group. children or black any other group yes. exactly. yeah. and the other question would be well is abolition just become a kind of uh blackened version of deconstruct, right? Because it's mm -hmm. exactly what deconstruct, that what deconstruction mean, me meant for the past decades in Western academia, right? Mm -hmm. and it's just about um, redefining those terms, right? That it's not about destroying things, but it's about resignifying mm -hmm. realities and things of that sort. So is abolition just became a kind of Deridian, uh, uh, the Deridian game, the Deridian play on words and, mm -hmm. and um, uh, affirmations and 
as it became just a completely depoliticized mm -hmm. interpretation of the world. Or the second interpretation would be quite more literal, right? We were mentioning uh, uh, winter and this notion of no humans involved, right? Mm -hmm. It's really about the uh, disposable character and quality of Black men and boys, really. Uh, it means that we should just get rid of Black men, that Black men are simply um, a non-important part of uh, society and that we should um, simply destroy them. So I think in the first interpretation, well, abolition as a concept loses everything it was about historically. And mm -hmm. in the second interpretation, we have, well, a blatantly racist idea that uh, Black men simply do not uh, matter. So right, right. I do think it's possible to make, a, even in the more charitable way of interpreting it, mm -hmm. I think we, could, uh, we, we simply cannot have an interesting or good politics or theory from this notion of abolishing <clears throat> men. Yeah. But, uh, I'm curious of, of having your thought about it, especially since this notion kind of uh, uh, had rise as mm. an answer to uh, black male studies, that the field you can and develop. Yes, it, it, and I want to I want to try to be as clear as possible on this. Um, if we take abolition, abolishing black men in the first sentence, sentiment that that you express, this idea of reformation. I think it becomes interesting that black men have been robbed of contributing any useful um, ideas from the standpoint of being black men. That means that we don't get the Fanons, we don't get Du Bois, we don't get Carter G. Woodson, that somehow the history of, of black men sharing ideas and revolutionary sentiments about black liberation become nullified and worthless simply because of some notion of masculinity that the people claiming abolishing black men um means right the second the second thing i would ask is or suggest is that the people claiming to abolish black men retreat into this erroneous reductionism of black masculinity that makes it wholly and completely synonymous with violence patriarchy and harming others so within this group of graduate students, really, maybe some scholars. I know Christina Sharp um, made a tweet that she didn't want to get out, you know, um, trying to critique black male studies as a crisis of thought. I don't know if that linked to ab <laughs> abolishing black men or not. But, but what it does say then is the idea of reconstructing black men because they are violent, because they are patriarchal, and because they are heterosexual. Um, should be on the board of Black liberation. Now, when challenged with any empirical or historical evidence that would justify such a claim, these abolitionists of Black men have no data or no evidence suggesting that Black men are a bigger threat to anyone else than any other group. What they try to do is point out things like intimate partner homicide, that disproportionately affects the black community in the United States as evidence that black men are dangerous to women, children, and other sexual minorities. But that data does not suggest that black men are the sole killers of black women. Black women also disproportionately kill black men and disproportionately kill black children. Again, this is not about the identity that the person or individual who commits this crime holds. It is about the environment and the systematic and structural violence they find themselves within. So if we're trying to reconstruct the idea of black men away from an idea of black masculinity that harms people, then we need to lower the amount of violence and the amounts of poverty in the community and the systems that they actually live within. This would not be specific to them. It would also affect other groups. Now, what these people do is they try to play language games, which suggests that, oh, by abolition, we mean get rid of toxic masculinity. 
But again, the history of black men has not shown that they're toxic, that they have toxic masculinity or hegemonic masculinity. Again, these people don't understand the very terms that they're utilizing. Hegemonic masculinity specifically describes the dominant form of white masculinity that runs the capitalist system and the hegemonic forces like the media that is allowed to control the way that people think. Black men, even by the admission of R.W.S. Connell, who comes up with the theory, says that black men exist outside of that system. In fact, she goes so far as to say that the only serious challenge to hegemonic masculinity across the world has not been feminism, but been the anti-colonial movements of black men throughout the world, fighting against the expansion of the Western metropole. So what we're dealing with is not a serious intellectual conversation. So I'm not willing to be that generous. These people are trying to suggest that it is the idea of black men trying to imitate white men, something, again, that has no empirical evidence that justifies us targeting and abolishing the idea of black manhood. Now, while black male studies is not specifically interested in, in rescu rescuing or vindicating a notion of black masculinity, it is interesting in pointing out that people from the groups of black males throughout the world that have been oppressed have created some of the most radical and revolutionary sentiments to challenge white supremacy and colonialism. Now, insofar as these people want to abolish, and I seriously doubt it's Derridian because I, given their, given what they say on Twitter, I don't think they've read Derrida, but let's say that that's the claim. Derrida <laughs> suggests to us that the notion of white knowledge, the very constructs we use in our grammars, our semiotic orientation, are the products of white mythology. If we took the Derridian sensibility seriously, could we ever fully believe that we capture the full meaning of a erroneous or dangerous black masculinity, given that the counterexamples of black male revolutionaries like Malcolm King, Kwame Ture, Malcolm X, right? Would these not stand in contradiction of what we think fully encapsulates black masculinity? See, the Derrida had the suspicion of whether or not language fully captured the meanings that exist not only through history, but in the way that we utilize the term. If these people were serious Derridians, wouldn't that be the first question they should ask? So I think that when these people are making this argument, they're much more akin to the second interpretation. Because what you have people like Rebecca Wilcox from Princeton suggesting is that she hates straight black men. What you have people like Christina Sharp suggesting is that straight black men have no status in the production of black liberatory knowledge. So what we're actually discussing is whether or not eliminating black men who are thought to be dangerous, who are thought to be compensatory, meaning because they're oppressed and not allowed to have a full vision of what it means to be black men and boys in the society, they ultimately turn to harming people, right? Which is what Bell Hooks argued, that black people would be better off without them. Now, that genocidal logic, right? Which I think is the second meaning of the term or second aspect of the term you described, has been proliferating throughout the academy for quite some time. Black male studies is a response to that notion that black men are ontologically flawed and defective, that the only response that black men have to white supremacist oppression is to harm others, to try to become the, the, the mimics of their, of their patriarchal fathers. And, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm speaking so seriously about this because what often happens in in this realm of Twitter, that's really a reflection of the lack of serious intellectual diversification in, 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 in black studies and other gender studies in the United States, is that you have theories that were created by white women and white colonizers, suggesting that black men and other indigenous men did not have any sort of ego formation that allowed them to define themselves. And because they were inferior, they saw the white man and white culture as a savior. So they developed, this is Manoni, they developed a, a, co a dependency complex, right? That developed into the idea by people like Shulamitha Firestone that black men have no notion of masculinity. So they exist next to the white man as a father would to a child. The white man is the father and the black man <laughs> seeks to imitate the white man. 
Now, these theories were developed in the 1970s, but they served as the foundational basis for contemporary gender theory. So it's not surprising when someone like Kimberly Crenshaw quotes the second assault, which says that black men utilize rape to imitate the white master. It doesn't become surprising when Bell Hook says that white men, black men are violent, no different than white men because they're trying to imitate white masculinity. And people have then said, well, because these other black feminist theories have said this argument, right, even though it aligns with the criminological foundations of white feminism, it's a legitimate perspective. So without any evidence whatsoever, there's a long standing belief within black theory, black gender theory, that black men want to be white men. But everything we have, be it their understandings of manhood, when you interview black men in the United States and the UK, right? Do they want or have the same values as white men? Absolutely not. When you ask them about their visions of community or masculinity, they say they believe that to be a true black man is to be intercommunal, take care of other people, to make sure you serve as a role model and example for others in your community. These are the answers that black men give throughout the United States and elsewhere about what they think manhood, not masculinity, manhood is. And instead of us saying, what does the research and history tell us about the genius of black men and boys? We now have a, a dehumanized ethos driving conversations saying that oh, half of the segment of Black people need to be abolished. So the generosity in this regard is somewhat short with me because these are coming from people that tweet publicly that they hate Black men, specifically hate straight Black men. So what sort of program of liberation do you have when you want to eliminate roughly 22 million black people from the black community? You see, this, this kind of genocidal and dehumanizing logic, which in, towards any other group would be designated as hate speech, becomes a possibility in how we're trying to appropriate radical language to serve the hateful, the hateful ideology of a certain segment of black academia. And I would ask you this question. Imagine the uproar if a white liberal said something like this. You see, we, we, keep, we keep playing this game, right? Everything's about interpretation. So you can say hateful things towards black men and boys who are being shot in the streets, excluded from jobs in the academy, not finding jobs even in everyday society, and then say, well, we, we, they deserve our hatred. And you build up Trump charges saying that because black men kill black women, they deserve our hatred. But then when you look at the data, you're talking about 200 people. You're talking about less than 300 people that commit these horrible crimes. How does that justify interpreting 22 million on the basis of what 200 or 300 have done? We don't do that for other groups because in other groups, we recognize that's hate speech. That's propaganda. But when it comes to black men, we suppose that the progress of black thought is the elimination and distance we have to the group that we think is the most dangerous, deviant, and lowest in society. And this is why I was suggesting Bowman earlier. Bowman says that the academy can't handle the new poor. Now, he's not only talking about black people there, but he's, of course, talking about the various crises that emerge either through refugees, immigration status, et cetera, that people don't really care about people who would be considered the wretched of the earth. Here, what we have is that because anti-blackness is so solidified within the psychology of black people throughout the West, you have a movement saying that any distance from the most hated black group is progress. So if you can remove yourself, be it through feminism, queer theory, the fact that you're educated, your class status, from these working class black men who the government and society target to, for kill, to be killed and murdered, then you have made some sort of progress in the evolutionary hierarchies of humanity because you're not seen as the low. And instead of us thinking about the ways that we imprint deviance, violence, murder, and just insidiousness upon this group, we praise graduate students who say that we too hate poor black men. You see, the, this is what I mean about the intellectual dishonesty. Black male studies is not attacked because it's not true. Black men well, studies is attacked because it's exposing how black people who market and profit off of the idea of black liberation are very specifically serving the interests of white liberals. 
In other words, the black people calling for critical black studies that want to abolish black men share the same hatred for black men and the same ideas and agendas of the white liberals they say they proclaim that they work against. Black male studies is exposing this through history and science. Black male studies has the courage to say black men are not perfect, but they're not less than human. So when you think about what Winter is talking about, when you think about what Robert Staples is talking about, when you think about what Jim Sedanus is talking about, he is talking about the accumulation of negative social capital, poverty, criminality, deviance, and the need of the civil society to protect itself from those, enlisting the efforts and the words and voices of black elites and aspirational minorities that say we will co-sign this liberal system because those groups are allowed to elevate within the academic and middle class structure, whereas black men will always be stained by the idea that they are criminals and should be sanctioned and not allowed to roam free in American society. So my patience for the kinds of people that engage in this kind of language is very short lived. Because it makes no sense to say that the that the behavior of a few hundreds determines not only the actions and propensity of millions, but also the psychology and personality of groups of people that have made tremendous contributions and still do make tremendous contributions to black families, neighborhoods, communities, and the overall struggle for black people to be free. It's a disingenuous, hateful notion that's being allowed to pass because it aligns with contemporary feminist and liberal agenda. Well, thank you, Tommy. I think that's uh, a very important message, a very important point to to make. And I think <clears throat> both Black Male Studies and, and institutions like the Franz Fanon Foundation exist also to unmask those kind of imposters and to uh, give back its original meaning to uh, Black anti-colonial and decolonial uh, political agendas and notions such as abolition, which got hijacked, as you said, and which now has become at least partly uh, a tool for those kind of um, agendas, anti-Black agenda, anti-Black men agenda. And I think, uh, yes, yes. Uh, we have um, made uh, a point and I hope this point is going to be to be heard. Um, do you have any additional comments, remark, analysis to, to make? Um, well, I, I would you, say Tommy or Mireille? Personally, no, but I, I think it's uh, it would be uh, interesting for, uh, for for even for the the website to have some uh, abstract of your of this conversation to present it and uh, if uh, one of you can do that just no write problem. some uh, hmm? no problem yes i think it's uh, because it's a very important uh, important um, topic issue and mm. uh, <laughs> is absolutely i think for us in France, for example, it will be absolutely impossible to speak on that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Norman? No, I think I think the problem the problem is in 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 France uh, the notion of abolition. Well, there's other problems with the notion of abolition in France, like the fact that it's all about prostitution and things of that sort. Yeah, it, it's a it's it's a it's a whole different beast. Like they. <laughs> I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't even engage in that. Like it's too. It, it's, it's almost too late. <laughs> it's the, the concept that has become. But it, I, I've, I've, I've I've written not about prostitution, but I've written a, a paper a, a paper about uh, this question of abolition appeared uh, and blackmail studies appeared two months ago. So, or so. Um, and you told me you wanted to add something. Well, yeah, I think. You know, here, here's what always concerns me, is that we have numerous Black intellectuals that are willing to proselytize a certain version of Black liberation that involves abolition, that involves the provocativeness of, say, the Afro-pessimist claim, right? Blackness is slave, etc. But then when it comes to who are the Black people we're willing to stake our lives for, 
Black people become absent from that conversation. So you have people saying, let's talk about Black liberation. Let's talk about burning the world down. But it doesn't seem there's a lot of Black people that's going to be along for that journey. Mm -hmm. So a very serious reflection about how we think about the development of Black political theory commits us to asking what is it that's being internalized in Black consciousness or the Black mind that is fundamentally anti-Black? What is it about learning psychoanalysis? What is it about learning these other tools that Europeans developed that have us developing theories of Black liberation that almost necessitates the elimination of, the, of half of the Black people we want to be supposedly liberated? And this idea worries me because whereas in previous generations of black, you know, intellectual debate, we've debated about the end goal of political action. Do we believe democracy can exist in America or does it have, do we have to leave America? Do we need black power or do, can liberalism incorporate? Mm -hmm. These are the debates of previous generations. Now we've advanced to a 21st century where the very notion of understanding power, history, economics, et cetera, has taken a backseat to how one identifies themselves, where the foundation of Black politics and Black consciousness towards liberation isn't about what we know or what we've done, but how we identify ourselves. And that identity is then utilized to demonize and morally condemn other people who we mm -hmm. don't believe should be part of our moral community and political organization. So there's a certain fatalism that's involved in the ways that we've approached the question and the problem of Blackness in the 21st century that I think overshadows and is a real danger in how we see the process and the cultivation of Black liberation and Black consciousness towards self-dignity and, and, and realization in the future. We now, we've always fought against Black elites, but the proliferation of certain types of ideas which suggest that certain groups of Black people should not have the right to exist is us interiorizing, internalizing, interiorizing dehumanization as the praxis of, of Black political theory. And that's a real problem. The idea that certain people are outside of moral consideration because of their identity or sexual practices uh, pose a real concern for how we think we're going to generate the black communities and a black public that we're going to speak to in the future. And as much as we want to dance around the ideas of democracy and democratic liberation, and even the very contestation of debate, that doesn't start if the background is the need to eliminate some people or create liberation in their absence. So I think black political theory and I think radical black theorists um, have a very different beast to start thinking about in the 21st century that has not yet been seriously considered. Yeah. Do, 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 you, think, do you think we can, it's a, it's a naive question, but uh, do you think through the issue of uh, black masculinity, we can interrogate uh, white supremacy as there is a space for that? In I the believe so. In the mainstream, uh, actually, in the main, where where the mainstream is right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, there... yes, I do. Because yeah. remember, black male studies, you know, and and this, if if you allow me a moment, I, I my frustration is is that black male studies is a study of racialized men. I am interested in what happens to black men in Africa, black men in America, black men in the Caribbean, et cetera, all of them, because when you look at how violence accumulates right against black people in any movement yeah black men are demonized and this holds true practically for any racial group throughout the 20th century when you dehumanize a group all the pictures of dehumanization all the depictions of of racial groups as monsters are are almost entirely men there are very few <laughs> exceptions to that so if we want to understand how genocidal logics and the removal right of groups or races of people happen you have to start with what's being demonized first and foremost which are going to be their men and boys and the intellectual process of interrogating that seems to be so contentious precisely because and this is my personal suspicion i have some evidence for it right 
that the the liberal movements we see, be it white liberalism or feminism, presuppose or demand the existence of a demonic black male to justify their political program. Mm. So when you think about white women across the world making the argument for suffrage, the idea was how would you enfranchise a black beast who's a rapist that wants to destroy white civilization when you have white women who are your wives, your daughters and mothers who love white supremacy and want to see white people flourish? When you look at Title VII in the Civil Rights Movement, the same idea. How would you enrich black men who are violent, poor, and want to destroy society with crime with opportunities to better themselves, but white women don't have the same opportunity? Every progressive movement has utilized the struggle and dehumanization of black people as the basis by which they justify their own claims, that they need power above black people to preserve white society. So if we don't understand the ways in which black men, right, have been demonized and used in this way, do we really understand how racism operates and works? Right. Mm. This is the same. This is the same point that I think Fanon brings when he says, look, the colonial system is a sexualized system. It's a system yeah. that requires us to maintain the sanctity mm -hmm. of the white family, where the man's in charge, the woman's the second leader, the children reproduce the norms they get within the home. The black man is seen as a creature because of his genitalia that can disrupt the biological and cultural continuity of the white family. So it makes it makes sense then that he would be de de dehumanized and fractured in his reality as to whether or not he's a monster. Because if mm -hmm. he internalizes that, right, He'll stay in his place, as Woods, as Carter G. Woodson says, right? You teach the Negro that he's only a monster, that he has no history. He creates the place for himself. He ostracizes himself from society. So when we look at segregation, Jim Crowism, police killing, incarceration, these are all institutions targeted to men. And we've been very dishonest about how these things are affecting our whole people. The issue isn't to save black men, it's to save, is to understand the logics that operate to destroy black people. Yes, but I think what you said is uh, very interesting because if you see the situation, uh, the situation, how uh, uh, the white white uh, world treated the uh, African uh, world, it's exactly the mm -hmm. same, uh, the same, um, um, uh, the same way. Uh, when you explain how the white supremacy is treating black people, particularly in the uh, U.S. It is exactly the same, the same uh, or means, the same means put in place mm. to treat African people in Africa. Yes. It is exactly the for me. It's a, what you said exactly the same relationship between dominant and dominated, and uh, between white world and African world, black world in Africa. Mm -hmm. I don't know yeah. if it's clear. No, it is clear. It is clear. But see, this is this is. I very much see, like, for example, Winter suggests building off of Fanon's notions of sociogeny, that we have to create a Black studies that can trace the taxonomy and categories that, for, that are used in Black consciousness. Mm. Black male studies does that. It asks what are the categories and the content, the meaning behind the mechanisms of non-being. Mm. And these other people say they're about studying non-being, but they don't want to get their hands or their minds dirty. They don't want to get into the role of castration. They want to say it and then move away from it. But what does it really mean to castrate a Black man? What is what is the meaning behind that in the colonial context? What does it mean for the British to do what they did to the Momo and Kenya? Penetrate them with brooms and sand and scorpions, right? What is that brutality? Mentality mean and how they're trying to distort and challenge what black manhood is. So we can be we can be post-colonial and you know exotic all day, but there are <laughs> black men and boys that exist in the real world. So so what then do you say to a black man and a black boy when he says there are white people coming to destroy our people? We want to fight against them, and that has been the historical role from Haitian from the Haitian Revolution forward. Mm. You tell them that they're toxic. You tell them that they want to be their pay. They want to be their oppressor because they want to defeat their oppressor. See, is this is this the kind of ethical system that we have now imposed? We see no problem if a woman sought to kill her rapist. We don't say that she wanted to be her rapist. She sought to protect her soul, her mind, and her body from the imposition of a foreign power. 
But you see black men and boys who have given their lives in multiple wars for multiple centuries to protect their people, right? Their mm -hmm. culture, their language, their women, their mm -hmm. mothers, their children. And we say that the only process of liberation that beats in their hearts is not freedom from colonialism, but the imitation of the white oppressor that they don't, don't even know. You see, it's the nonsensicalness of how we read black history that allows these theorists to play dishonestly with the representations of our people, where they can introduce any kind of malice in the minds of black men without having to answer to the testaments, histories, or even the political tracks that we've solidified over the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the argument that black male studies is making is that it is willing to challenge how the world has asserted black men and by effect black humanity has been misrepresented through contemporary theories that claim they want to liberate us when they actually only dehumanize. Okay. Yeah. I, that's 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 clearly interesting. I think we, we have now in contemporary theory, we have the idea that uh, black feminism is the ultimate evolution of uh, the black radical tradition of black radicalism and stuff. But if we see many theories are way closer to an evolution, the ultimate evolution of like black reactionary thought of mm. people like George Schuyler's who tended to say that uh, radicals like uh, Garvey or Du Bois, especially Garvey's, the Garvey's were like black Hitler's and stuff. And this notion of uh, black being racist, black radicals being racist, being fascist, being new fascist evolved to the notion of them being patriarchs and being sexist. And we have always this discourse that labels black uh, revolutionary thought as a form of black ultra reaction and fascism mm -hmm. and kind of even black totalitarianism in the making. Yes. And I think- what do, they, what do they say about Alice Walker? Alice Walker is an African or a black womanist, and she she was supporting the guy David Ick, supported and shared his book, endorsed his book on anti-Semitism. You see, this is the discussion shouldn't be about the outliers. And this is, again, this is the trope, the outliers of black men. If any black man does something, he's what every black man wants to do. So if you find a black man that's anti-Semitic, all black men are anti-Semitic. You see, this is this is the logic of racism. This is the logic of a kind of white supremacism that says that the failures of one represents the innate character of the others. And what and what we're dealing with now is the dishonesty and the participation of a certain sect of black feminism that wants to demonize all black men for the transgressions of a few. Imagine if we did the same game with black women. You see, and notice black male studies makes no arguments about some moral or essential flaw of black women because that's not what the discipline's there to do. The discipline is to say, given the historical and sociological evidence we have of black oppression, what then can be our claims for understanding how patriarchy, capitalism, and white supremacy operate on the bodies and populations of racialized men around the world? It's a it's a it's a field dedicated to answering hard questions that people don't want to take up because these other theories like black feminism, right, and white feminism and white liberalism have been very comfortable with the extermination of black men and boys to make civil society safe. It's a fundamental contradiction in the very concepts and notions we have of blackness and black liberation. You can't hate half your people and then say you love all black people. <laughs> Those theories allow the bias and hatefulness of a certain segment of Black people to dictate the cutting-edge theory being represented as radical in the academy. And we're challenging that, and hence we're unpopular. But, but, but make no mistake, when history, when we're dead and gone, and people you know, will write what they write, there will be people that, that are able to testify that when Black men and boys were being killed, and black people were being dehumanized, and Muslims were being criminalized. There was one discipline willing to stand up and say, those people are still human. Because that has not been the contemporary charge of any other theory that has been advanced in the last 40 or 50 years. Well, thank you, uh, Tommy. Thank you, Mireille. Uh, thank you, Azdil. And uh, see you for the next, in the next show. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs>